So welcome to everybody that's just joined us. Uh, this is the first live vibration research webinar stream from the UK. So good afternoon to everybody here in the UK and good morning to everybody that's joining us from the US. We are expecting to run more sessions like this in the coming weeks for all of those people that are, are working from home or maybe not have as much test work as they uh, have in the past. Um, I believe we have plans for sessions specifically looking at filled data environments to laboratory tests such as our fatigue damage spectrum, recreating shocks via our shock response spectrum, um, either that or with the time waveform replication. We should also be introducing our new STAG software that's there to simplify the process of generating mixed mode tests from field data. I hope that you find the sessions will be useful. Uh, they're mainly aimed at those uh, that already do vibration testing. So hopefully uh, a refresher or a top up of your existing knowledge. So some background in vibration testing uh, will be useful. If the topics are new to you or you'd like to know more uh, detailed information, then please message me after or during the webinar or search the online resources within our website um, on www.vibrationresearch.com. Also, if you'd like a demonstration of any of the features you see within Vibration View, then please get in contact with us and we'll arrange an online demonstration specifically for your needs. So this session, uh, we're going to look inside the test standards at the test methods that control uh, within the vibration and struck standards for aerospace and defense. More specifically, how these standards should be used to, used to achieve consistent and repeatable results. So just to introduce myself, my name is Mark Brown. I'm the country manager for vibration research. I've been involved with vibration testing for 30 years now. Um, so just so you know that I'm human and confession time, the first product I broke, broke was a vibration test of a dynamically tuned gyroscope that was quite expensive um, at the end of a three month test program where I forgot to connect up the control accelerometer during a sign sweep test. And um, it was with an old analog vibration controller. And I turned the gain up a little too quickly without the control accelerometer attached. And well, the lesson for the day is Never believe you know everything and always check your test setup. So looking at the presentation. So we'll take a look at the main test standards within the aerospace and defense industries. They're from the US and from the European perspective. So sorry for anybody outside this geographic area. Maybe you can get your VR representative to do a similar talk. We'll have a look at the general test parameters within the standards. Um, looking at the control vibration tests and the parameters within those specific test types, such as random, sign, and shock. We'll look at each parameter and we'll take a look inside the standard and see how they compare with each other, because there are subtle differences between them. We'll also have a quick look at vibration view and see how your vibration controller can be used to ensure these par parameters are verified. Some limitations uh, will be sticking to single shaker testing and single axis testing. We may look at extending this presentation at a later date for more complex and um, larger shaker systems. So having a quick look at the test standards. So here are the, the main test standards that uh, are used. So we have a, the NATO standard at the top there, the STANAG 4370, or it's called the ACTP, the Allied Environmental Conditions Test Procedures. 400 is specifically for vibration. Uh, the national standards that sit below the, national, the NATO standard. So you have the US standard, MIL standard 810. I'm sure you've all heard of that. So methods 4, 1, uh, 514 and 516. In the UK here, we have the test standard 0035 with tests M1 and M3. And then there is a standard in France called Gamin EG13, which I think was last updated in 1987. Um, so it's, I'm not quite sure whether that's used much now, but I'm sure there are other national defense standards, but these standards are used for military aircraft as well. So also we've got the commercial aircraft standard, the RTCA D0160 or the European equivalent, the EuroK ED14. So we're looking at sections eight and seven within those standards. And then below that, you've got kind of commercial standards, the IEC 60068, uh, where you have a random sign and shock variant, so dash 64, dash 6, and dash 27. So there are many other standards associated with aerospace testing, specifically in the space sector, uh, but many of these will have their roots within these standards that we'll be showing you today. 
and they will use the kind of control and tolerances and parameters from these specifications. So why do we need these test standards? Well, we're really looking at repeatable test methods. We want to ensure that we get reliable results obtained from one lab or reproducible in another lab or by another test engineer. They also contain adequate test severities. Oh, hold on, I'm just gonna unfreeze my screen, I've just been told. Okay, you should be able to see me now. So yeah, sorry about that. That's a unscreened as a schoolboy error. Um, so we'll be looking at the repeatable results uh, within the test standards, and but we'll be ignoring the test severities for now. Okay, so we'll be looking at uh, general test controls. We'll be looking at uh, control positions, monitor positions, control strategies and averaging, looking at motion controls, and then look at limiting and notching. I'm just going to quickly go back while my screen was uh, paused. So we're going to look at the test standards. We're going to look at general test controls, look at the random tests, sign tests, and then shock tests. So looking at the general test controls. So how do we ensure that we get the same result from a, the same from a test done in different labs on different shaker systems? So here's an extreme example of a, a small product on a big shaker or the equivalent of a big product on a small shaker. So we could be looking at different test setups where somebody's decided that they're going to put the, a box or a test items in centrally on a shaker. Somebody else has taken the, the uh, time to look at the center of gravity and done a different test setup. So all these things can influence a test. So here we've got a very large test item. So somebody's decided to put it on a very large head expander where somebody else may have considered to put it across two different shakers and run the test in such a way. So how do we ensure that we get the same reproducible results? So here we have a test item that's on its uh, on a slip table in its correct orientation. And then maybe there's a, another test lab that hasn't got a slip table that runs a test in a vertical orientation. So all these are going to give us different results if we're not careful. So just looking at measurement locations, looking at different terminologies. So looking at the standards, we can talk about fixing points. So the fixing point of the test item, the test fixture and test item interface, which may be subtly different. We talk about measurement points, we talk about response points, and then checkpoints. So checkpoints would be somewhere where you're trying to ensure the test specification is being met. Um, and then you may have a, a reference point, which is subtly different, which is maybe a, a, a point on the structure where you're trying to get a different specification. So we can look at single point control, where we're just getting the test, uh, test reference at a single control point, or what we call fictitious reference points, where we've got multiple control and nowhere on the structure are we actually achieving the uh, test specification. So we have a fictitious reference point in that instance. Okay, so just looking at a test here. So we have a, a test item here with, on a very, very crude fixture, which is some tie bars if you look down in the bottom right hand corner. So we're clamping the product down. So we have a, a test item interface here at the bottom of the screen. I'll just put my little laser marker on here. So here we have the test item interface here. So the fixing points actually to the in real life may be up here on each side of the product. We have measurement points on the structure and we have another fixture test item interface up here. And then we've also got a little measurement accelerometer down here, which we're checking the input from the shaker below here. So if we were to uh, test it in a more representative way, we might generate a fixture that interfaces at the correct fixing points here and here. So we might decide to control up on the fixture on these two positions here rather than at the interface to the head expander. But then we actually find out that uh, the item is uh, not actually mounted to a rigid structure and it's on quite weak uh, bracketry. So this test may also come up with a, a different result because of uh, not giving the correct fixing points. Um, quite often that if you have the fixture too rigid, uh, you may break at the, the test item fixture interface because it being too, being too rigid. 
<laughs> okay, so here we've got more accelerometers now on our product under test where we're monitoring the, the test input to the, to the test item, looking at the response on the other side of the interface to the uh, fixing point. Um, we may be looking at the input to the bracket here. So these are all positions where people may control the test from. So then we may find out that the actual uh, product may actually be sitting on AV mounts. So we then have another problem where the control position may be on this side of the AV mount or still at the interface to the product. So all of this is bringing more and more of the aircraft or the, the product uh, interface structure uh, into the test. So you can see the test is possibly getting more and more, in, more, and more representative. Okay, so we'll just take a quick look at different control strategies. So within the specifications, there are, are options for doing single point control. So if you know that your control is going to be achieved um, from a single point and there is no differences between the fixing points, then single point control may be possible. Generally, in the aerospace testing, uh, anything bigger than a, um, the size of your, your armature, you will almost definitely need multi-point control because you'll be testing up to quite high frequencies, up to two kilohertz or beyond in some instances nowadays. So we have different strategies here. We have the arithmetic means where we add up each of the checkpoint locations and take the average of those and then try and get that to meet the reference spectrum. You can also have weighted averaging where you, you weight a factor on an individual location more than another. So please be careful when using average control because if you have an instance where you have say four control accelerometers, each looking at those. Um, if you have one location that is um, driving and, and having a response and the other three don't have a response, the average can mean that that one response can be four times the actual reference spectrum. So be careful. So the other strategy you normally use is extremal control and maximum is normally the one where we take the maximum of the different control locations. So in this instance here, we may have two control accelerometers on either side of the input to the AV mounts, and we'll either be looking at the average or the maximum. Okay, so if we have a look at the those different control types, here is a, an acceleration spectral density plot from a, a test from 10 to 2 kilohertz. As you can see here, we're just using a single point control, and we have a, a single control line here that's meeting the reference spectrum. So here we can have responses of different parts of the product, either the fixture or on the, on the product, and we can show them on the same graph here. So this next plot, I've changed it now such that we now have a two-channel average control between it was channels two and three. So you can see here where we now have average control between two positions, and we can see parts of the, the fixture that are not responding as much as others at different frequencies. But you can see the average is always meeting the control line. So if we then go on to the next step, we can look at limiting. So uh, certain specifications may require that there is a, a limit on the response or a, it may be force limiting or notching, whereby we take a response and we notch it. So you can see here where I'm limiting now on the response of this accelerometer and ensuring it doesn't go above the level you see there and the corresponding effect it has on the control signal where it's below the, the reference line. There. Okay, so next thing we'll have a quick look at um, is motion controls. So if we're talking single axis testing, so the motion uh, induced by the vibration generator should be such that the fixing points of the test item move substantially in a parallel axis of excitation. These are words from the standards, and they pretty much all say parallel motion, single axis testing. So what does this really mean for our shaker? So there's a, a cutaway of the shaker here where we can see the upper armature support here, and there's generally a bearing at the bottom of the armature here. So for those that uh, have seen in there, there are obviously different arrangements and different ways that the armature is guided and supported between uh, air-cooled shakers and, and uh, water cooled shakers and hydraulic shakers are obviously different. But just looking at uh, electrodynamic shakers for now. So you can see there are generally two attachment points, one up near the armature surface and one lower down. So 
first look into the, uh, the test standards. So just having a quick look at the history of the cross-axis accelerations within the MIL standard. So back at MIL standard 810E, there was no requirement for looking at cross-axis measurements. So then as you go up through the, uh, the standards, as it gets uh, to the current standard, MIL standard 810H, we're allowed to have 50% of the um, accelerations out of access below 500 hertz and 100% above 500 hertz. And the standard also says that if these are exceeded, they should be identified and addressed. So there's no real guidance on that situation. So the general guidance I would say is that if you are above these levels, then you should definitely report it. You should definitely be looking at the cross axis accelerations at your fixing points. So you can see here that uh, it has been alleviated from mil 810 g to H. So it's something to look at within your spec is obviously to have a look at which mill standard you're actually working with. So if we look at the DEF standard, the last two issues of the DEF standard, so the DEF standard's the same as mill standard 8 and H now, um, but it's also got a caveat that the overall GRMS should not exceed 50% of the in-axis vibration. So again, a slight difference there. Um, If we look at the uh, RTCA D0160, so the commercial aircraft spec, there is no definitive requirement within that specification for cross-axis measurements. So the motion should just be parallel and a rigid fixture and symmetrical. So, I mean, this standard hasn't been updated since 1997. So it may be, I'm not sure, I'm not part of the committee on this, so I don't know uh, when they're planning to update it is obviously used throughout the commercial world, but there is a, a DO357, which is a user guide supplement. So I suggest that people read that to see if there's any more guidance within that. So we'll also look at the commercial standard. So looking at the uh, 60068, uh, just for random testing there, um, it's got very similar to the DEF stand W35. I think the people that work on the DEF stand W35 committee um, also work on the 60068 committee. So, uh, they're looking to harmonize as much as possible. Okay, so just having a quick look at what this means for your armature. So there's a, a crude picture of a, an armature here and that's the top surface. So I'm looking at different positions within that, uh, on that armature. And if we kind of look at uh, rotations that the armature might make around its top support surface or around its bottom support surface. So these are kind of different motions that could be happening within by the armature. So this is just a quick slide to looking at the different positions. So just looking at the fact that you may get different responses at different locations, depending on where the rotation, whether it be a, a rotation around the X axis or the, around the Z axis there, um, or along the Y or the X axis. Um, you can see whether you'll get a positive or negative response um, from those. So if we look at a rotation from the bottom bearing, you'll get slightly different responses uh, to those different rotational moments. So if you can see, if we put a, a big head expander above these two positions, you're gonna get a much different response and you're gonna get different rotations happening because of that. So these are all things to bear in mind when you're looking at your fixturing and uh, the response to your fixture. So the other thing, apart from uh, those suspension modes of the armature, you can also get diaphragming and the mode shapes of the, uh, the head expander itself and the top of the armature. So these are looking for different things. So certainly watch out for phase shifts in measurements because of resonances. So if we look at a very crude uh, picture I've drawn here, so we've got a, a, a fixture with two bookends on either side of it here with accelerometers mounted up here for controlling of the item interfaces. And we can see that if the uh, fixture bends, that we're gonna get out of access motion occurring on those two fixture items. So we'll need to decide what to do with that. Okay, so cross axis accelerations, uh, what can we do about it? Uh, you can look at preventive maintenance. So you can look at your bare armature and your bare slip tile characteristics and do regular comparisons. So hopefully when you have your system installed, you'll have baseline measurements for your bare armature cross axis and slip table. Um, and you can do this via regular maintenance test, looking at the cross axis positions on your armature. Um, within Vibration View, you can save graph layouts and baseline traces for comparison 
or cut and paste in old measurements over the top of your existing measurements that you make during this process. So it's very easy to see differences in responses. The other thing I would suggest is add more measurement channels. You can't really have enough measurement channels when it comes to this aerospace testing and looking at cross axis motions. So I would always advocate doing cross axis motion tests during the actual test and see what results you're getting. As you can see from a, a, a head expander, expander or a fixture responses will change depending on uh, what's going on with a test item and the fixture. So I'd suggest at least 16 channels, looking at at least the five triaxial accelerometers to look at the responses of uh, the, the armature and the, uh, the input. So I would have a look at obviously automated test reports that we can do so we can add triaxial measurements to fixtures in test reports and show that. And we can also add mass traces to show the limits of the uh, different standards. So before we're testing, I'd always carry out precursor tests, looking at fixture resonances before you put the test item on and decide whether you've got the correct test set, set up for your test. So these can be done at a low level, but I'd always choose to do them at the full level, test level if possible. So we'd always look at the analyzer functions, we'd look at transfer functions, coherence and phase relationships when we're looking at these precursor tests. So we always have control of measurement locations close to the test item and the fixture, use multi-channel control, average or maximum control, and measure the cross axis during the test and decide whether to limit or, or abort a test because of these. So I'll have a quick look at, at uh, vibration view and uh, just show you some of the uh, aspects of what we've been looking at. So here I've got a, a random vibration test that if I start the test running, will quickly come up to level. And you can see here I've put a, a ghost channel up there from that from the previous test. So this test is just running from 10 to 1000 hertz and I have it on average control. So you can see how it uh, gets into control. And there we go. So at the moment, we're just counting up and we've got uh, degrees of freedom. So I'll come on to that later. Uh, I've added these annotations on here so we can look at the demand GRMS, the actual control. Um, we can look at in-band GRMSs um, for the uh, control signal. And we can look at out-of-band GRMSs and have a look at those separately. Okay, so I'm just going to stop that test and we'll continue. So looking at the vibration view, we've got the different aspects that we can use to help you with this process. So we can look at the system check. So this is a manual oscillator we can use. Uh, we can paste graphs, uh, ghost graphs from different files from previous tests to have a look at changes in responses for preventive maintenance. We can obviously add cross axis channels to our test setup and see the graphs on this. We can look at channel limits and channel aborts. So if I just quickly show you, oop, I go back to my random test. We can set limits here on channels. So we can look at channels and set RMS limits on channels. We can now have a channel tolerance on here. So we can set tolerances for individual channels rather than just a uh, generic controllable channels. Um, and the other aspect that we have within our software is the, uh, the notching capability. So we can create a not notch table here. So we can cut and paste responses in here for notching and scale it up and down, depending on what we want to do with relation notching. Okay. I'll just get rid of this. Okay, so if I go back to my presentation. Okay, so now we'll have a look at the, the random test controls and the random control parameters. So we'll have a look at power spectral density. We'll look at the statistical random sampling error, so the degrees of freedom. We'll have a look at the analyzer frequency bandwidth, the spectral lines and resolution. Uh, we'll look at out of test frequency range responses the RMS in band, and we'll have a look at amplitude distribution, a ketosis. So these are all random control parameters within the random tests. 
So just taking a quick look at our random PSD here, since it's just a flat random from 10 to 1,000 hertz. Uh, and you can see on here, we've got the, the current degrees of freedom specified at 120, and we've got plus and minus 3 dB tolerances. So this is a, quite a standard test, and people will be used to seeing this. So if I have a quick look at uh, some of the specs have uh, two, uh, lower uh, tolerances, such as RTCA, where they're plus or minus 1 dB, uh, below 500 hertz. So you'll see here on the blue line, the one and a half dB lines. So the RTCA test um, has a degrees of freedom set at 100. Um, so that they gives us this level of variance or hashiness within our PSD here. So you can see here that we're struggling to meet the requirement because we've got a few spectral lines that are going outside the plus or minus 1 dB. So this is a problem with the RTCA specification. Um, so it probably does need updating that you can't really achieve a minimum of 100 uh, degrees of freedom. So you'll probably need to increase your degrees of freedom for this test um, if you're going to try and meet the standard. So currently I'm just looking at a half a hertz resolution here. So that's the RTCA parameters there at minus one and a half dB. Okay, so just so that people get more of an understanding of what degrees of freedom really means, um, you need to uh, generate enough averages from your FFT loops uh, to provide a level of confidence in your uh, measurements that you're making. So, so the level of unconfidence we have in the measurements is due to causes that hashiness. So the more degrees of freedom we have, so the more averages we have, um, the higher confidence we can have in our results are actually at the true level. So you can see here, there's a, a subtle difference between um, 100 degrees of freedom and 120 degrees of freedom. So the mill standard, greater than 120, death standard, greater than 120. Um, so the only ones that have lower than that are the ACTP, the NATO standard and the, and the RTCA. So this is with a 95% confidence that we're going to be within plus or minus one and one dB or thereabouts one and a dB. So that's the level of hashiness in our on our PSD plots. Okay, so they're the the tolerances that we have for power spectral density. So we have our degrees of freedom, and there's the uh, corresponding uh, PSD tolerances. So I would definitely be concerned with the uh, 100 degrees of freedom with the RTCA D160 and this minus one dB tolerance below 500 hertz. So looking at the PSD tolerances, so within each span standard, so I'll just look at the latest standard of each one. So we have plus minus three dB and plus minus six dB above 500 hertz. Um, there's also a GRMS tolerance. Um, there are alleviations on this. So if, I, if you're doing multi-point control, there's an average control here where you're allowed plus or minus 6 dB and plus or minus 9 dB, as long as your overall GRMS is still within plus or minus 5%. So this is for the individual control positions. So this is where you need your channel tolerances to come in individually, which we've incorporated into the latest version of vibration view. So on the DEF standard, there's just a, a standard plus or minus 3 dB tolerance lines in the DEF stand, and there's an alleviation, historical alleviation that's within Annex D, uh, where you are allowed plus or minus six above 500 hertz. Um, on multi-point control, they have a slightly different take on things where they say that you're allowed plus five dB on each control position and minus 10 dB uh, at each control point. Okay, so, so this is quite useful having this. Obviously, if you have one, one channel going high and the other one goes low, you need that minus 10 dB there is, is very useful. On the RTCA, this is where it has the tight tolerances. Uh, ACTP is plus minus three and plus minus six. And then the uh, commercial standard 60068 is just a standard plus or minus three dB. Um, there is one thing I forgot to mention up here on the DEFSTAN W35 is that you're only allowed 5% of frequencies to go above the plus or minus three dB line. So they're obviously trying to get you to achieve the plus or minus three, but understand that uh, at various frequencies, you might not achieve this. 
Okay, now looking at the next parameter within the random vibration is looking at frequency resolution. So this is a little difficult to find in some of the standards, but um, it's defined uh, in the mill standard at two and a half hertz resolution as a minimum, below 25 hertz, and it's got to be above, uh, got to be a minimum of five hertz above 25 hertz. So most vibration controllers only have one resolution. Um, so you can be looking at at least one and a half hertz. Uh, there is a caveat with the mill standard where obviously it needs to be appropriate for your test. So if you've got a, a very uh, tailored test or a, a test with a high uh, resolution in it, um, you should be looking at sufficient. So in the mill standard, the, the wheeled vehicle vibration needs to be at least one hertz is sufficient. So another way of looking at power, uh, frequency resolution is looking at the spectral lines at your half power point on any measurements, any resonances you're making. If you try and take measurements um, from your PSD, you should be looking to have at least five spectral lines at a 3 dB point below your resonant peak. So I'll show you that on the, on the next slide. Um, the other method of looking at frequency resolution in 60068 is they want to see a certain number of lines below your lowest frequency. So um, that's half your lowest test frequency. They want to see at least two different um, data points at half the lowest frequency of your test. So looking at frequency resolution. So this is the, the frequency resolution. So here's that calculation to go from Q factor and, and resonance. So if we look at an example of a resonance at 130 hertz uh, with a Q factor of 10, uh, we're looking at a 13 hertz at 3 dB down point. Um, so we're looking at a minimum resolution around 2.6 hertz. So just to see that graphically, here we've got a resonance and vibration views calculate the Q factor. Um, so we can work out what this would be in this instance, which is 2.8 hertz. The other method within 6W68 looking at frequency resolution. So it looks at the, the low frequency portion and wants to try and make sure you've got two data points in this region of half your natural frequency. So if your F1 was one hertz, then you'd be looking at, at half a hertz. Okay, so another aspect within the test uh, or some of the, the uh, test standards is looking at uh, out of test frequency range. So the energy outside of your test standard. So if your test is only in this region between F1 and F2, so that's 10 to uh, 2000 Hertz. So you should be looking to measure up to twice that frequency. So if we look at the test standards and looking at half a low frequency. So we can see that, that graph again. So quite often they'll specify initial slope and a final slope within those as well. So it's not that you're trying to meet that final slope, it's just suggesting that you shouldn't go above this 3 dB at that value there. So you can go, you can roll off much, much quicker than this on the initial slope, um, and you can roll off a lot quicker than the minus 24 at the end um, on the upper frequency. But the uh, parameters to look at here, uh, we're looking at oversampling, we're looking at the initial and final slopes, and we're looking at inbound energy and out of band RMS energy here. So, a quick look at the test standards when it comes to GRMS. So, the MIL standard gives us plus or minus 10 cent on the GRMS from the reference, um, which is fairly typical on most specs, uh, apart from the RTCA, which does something different, where we're allowed plus 20 or a minus 5 uh, GRMS um, cent on the GRMS. Uh, the MIL standard comes up with a, a nice 25% uh, on the GRMS on the individual uh, channels that make up the control if you're doing multi-point control. And there is an alleviation in the death standard there of plus minus two dB. I'm not quite sure why they've changed from a percentage to, to dB there for uh, an alleviation. So more looking at the out of test frequency range responses. So the death standard is the uh, only one that really comes up with a tolerance here looking at the uh, out of band rms shall be less than 20 percent of the inbound rms so there's a quick calculation in the, in the specification where you look at the full band grms divided by the inbound grms and calculate the percentage and they require you to measure up to five 
five kilohertz or five times the highest frequency within your test specification. So this may be a new thing that may be coming up in later standards. Um, it's certainly a, a, a new thing within the, the DEF stand W35. Okay, a quick look at amplitude distribution. So this is something, another parameter within the random tests. So those that are not quite familiar with amplitude distribution, but if we have a random signal that's uh, uh, coming along here as a, a time history, the probability density is looking at the probability of hitting different peak levels. So these peaks here and plotting them on a graph on how often these peaks occur. So then you get a plot, which is a probability density curve. So if we look at um, all the specifications, uh, ask for uh, a Gaussian distribution, unless you know that your actual environment has a different uh, distribution. So we'll talk about ketosis in a moment. So there's our Gaussian distribution curve. And you'll notice, just at a point we'll come on to, that uh, you do get peaks above three sigma. So three times the, the RMS value or three times the standard distribution. So if we look at clipping and uh, limiting, which is a very, uh, um, yeah, a subject that not everybody agrees on, and you'll get different answers from different people, but we'll have a look at the specification on limiting because they don't all agree on this area. So if we look at our, our um, amplitude distribution graph here from a, a random uh, Gaussian test, so we can see the area underneath the different uh, sigmas. Yeah, so if we were doing sigma clipping at three, we're only looking at um, getting values here about 5% occurrences will be clipped. So anything between three and four sigma, you're going to be cut, starting to clip. So at 1%, even there, you're going to start clipping uh, occurrences that are going to occur. So if look at ketosis. So ketosis is a measurement of the peakiness of that uh, and the, the change to that distribution there. So it's a value you come out with that's associated with the, uh, the relative peakiness of that uh, probability density curve. So you can see here different uh, vibration with different ketosis is defined. So you can see how it necks in here and then you get wider um, and curved occurrences out here. It's a far better uh, measurement because it tells you how often these peaks are. Or it's a measure of how often you're getting these peaks as well as the, the amplitude of these peaks uh, within the vibration rather than just using the parameter of crest factor. So all crest factor is doing is telling you that you are getting a peak of that size. Um, so there's no information about how often you're getting these peaks. So ketosis is a value you should probably be looking at in your vibration test. And a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, does give you a ketosis of around three. And the standards that do mention ketosis within them do suggest of tolerances of about plus or minus 10%, but I'm not 100% sure of the, uh, they've just not plucked a, a figure out of the air there. So having a look at amplitude distributions, so within DEF standard W35, um, it just asks for nominal Gaussian distribution. Um, 6WC8, it mentions instantaneous values at the reference point shall be approximately Gaussian. Mill standard 810 just talks about Gaussian of the drive signal. Um, RTCA, the random signal, shall have a Gaussian distribution. And the NATO standard ACTP 400 just talks about being nominally Gaussian. But there are additional notes here. This is where the specs differ, and be careful when doing different tests here. So the DEF standard uh, says that you should have all occurrences up to 2.7 standard distributions, uh, whilst the occurrences greater than three shall be kept to a minimum. So this goes against the grain of everybody else's standard here. So if we look at 6068, it talks about crest factors or the, the peak to RMS ratios, the crest factor, and it talks about uh, drive sigma clipping, the crest factor, at the reference points shall be examined to ensure it contains at least three times the RMS value. And this crest factor should apply to each checkpoint. So every control position, you should be checking that the crest factor is correct at these values. And it also suggests that you should be monitoring the probability density shall be computed for the reference point during testing. So it doesn't talk about doing it just as a calibration check, 
uh, once a year on your vibration controller or on your shaker system. It does actually mention making these measurements during a test. So if you look at your standard 810 H, this is where it differs greatly from the 0035. It suggests that drive limiting should not be invoked. So it's a should not be invoked. Um, and it does talk about when you might invoke it, but it's saying you shouldn't do it and you should never have any clipping below three. So anybody out there that's clipping below three really uh, is not uh, meeting the mill standard. So in the RTCA standard, the commercial aircraft standard, the control signal, I think they mean the drive signal, may be limited to three times the DRMS. And then the ACTP says very similar to the DEF standard. So I think the, the two committees were, were meeting up when they came up with that uh, specification. Okay, so I'll have a quick jump into vibration view and have a quick look at the different uh, aspects of random vibration and where we can see on our chart here. So if I just go to quick editing a test, so if we've got a simple breakpoint table here, so we have our tolerances here, so the plus and minus tolerances, and we have abort tolerances that shall not exceed. Um, a new feature that we brought in is you can add channel tolerances here, so you can change them and put the, the correct values in there for the individual control channels. Okay, so I'll look at uh, the limits. So on our limits tab, we can take our limits from our, our table at the front there. And then you've also got this outliers so outside of your control tolerances, but obviously within your, your abort tolerances here. So you can specify a number of outliers before it will abort the test. You can have your channel tolerances here uh, be brought in. So you can have put in the individual control channels within your multipoint control. You can set the GRMS values for those individual channels. So the other points on here. So you can also set aborts on your RMS on individual channels. And if we have a, a quick look at notching, so with here we can bring in a notch table and you can limit a, a, a your test via a notch as well on the notch table. I quickly look at our parameters tab. So the out of band GRMS value. So we would look in our general parameters tab here and we'd be looking at oversampling. So if we're um, so this is that the amount of oversampling beyond our test frequency here. So we're looking at four times at the moment, or we can look at eight times here. So these are normally auto-checked here, but uh, you can see here. So if we were going to meet the DEF stand W35, we would probably be oversampling at eight times on our uh, RMS measurements. Okay, and then here we can just specify our number of spectral lines. So if you can define your spectral lines and you look at your frequency resolutions down here on our, for, uh, on our software. So the other aspect to look at is degrees of freedom. Uh, we just uh, just define the exact degrees of freedom you need and just type it in there as a value. Just one thing to, to bring in, uh, we do have our IDOF facility, um, which allows you to see much, much higher degrees of freedom, much, much quicker. So it allows you to use the fine resolutions down here if you've got fine resonances. Um, and IDOF kicks in within four frames of data. So I'll show you that when we'll quickly run this test. So that's great for short duration, random vibration tests where you need to see what's going on very quickly. Um, we'll have a look at the degrees of freedom and how they change uh, time. Okay, so I just okay this. So quickly run this test. So while we're running this test, you can see here, I've just put some annotation on the graph here. Um, I've just dragged over the current degrees of freedom onto our chart. And when we get up to full level, so this test, I'm not doing any level changing, I'm just going straight up to the full level test. And you can see um, how quickly we're going to be uh, running the, uh, the test. Hopefully it's not just going to start, it should continue. What I've done wrong with, I've turned the limiting on. Hold on.
I just stopped this test again, sorry. why I'm st stuck with starting on here at the moment. I've also changed something in here that I, uh, I shouldn't have done. I'll just run a test with channel one, hold on. Sorry about this. So now see, see the test is running, um, and I'll just show you a few things I've put on the annotations here. Um, I'm showing our percentage out of band noise there required by the DAS standard, uh, looking at the in-band GRMS and looking at the uh, overall GRMS values of different channels. So these are just annotations that you can put onto your charts or put into your test reports. And you can see here the current degrees of freedom ramping up here. So we're 26 seconds into the test and we're only at 60 degrees of freedom. If I quickly turn on IDOF, so that shows you what IDOF can do for you in relation to seeing at the start of your test whether you're in control or not. So I look at the, our ketosis values for those that are not used to ketosis. So this is the value here of ketosis with time. So you can see here, as you st start the test, you can see that it gradually settles down and we've got a ketosis of three. Um, and here is our probability density. Okay. Okay, so I'll just quickly stop that test. Okay, so I'll just quickly go back to our presentation. Okay, and we'll move on to sign testing. So just quickly looking at the sign test parameters. So the sign control parameters, uh, looking at the amplitude peak, uh, look at single point control and average and uh, maximum control, look at frequency resolution, look at signal tolerances and distortion, and we'll look at tracking filters. So just taking a quick look at the sign test parameters. So depth stand double three five, looking at a plus minus ten percent on the amplitude. Um, you can see here that six W six eight has a, a fifteen percent on the amplitude. Um, it does mention though that there is that tolerance does include five percent for instrumentation error. So you could possibly look that you should hone in that tolerance because it does include this instrumentation error. So mill standard and uh, RTCO both at ten percent. Um, so we do have some alleviations for multi-point control, UNL plus minus 5 dB on each control point. Um, and there was an additional alleviation within Annex D there, so take a, take a look at that as well. So amplitudes outside of the, the, the range should be 10% of the, uh, uh, the values inside the range. Um, and if we have a look at the mill standard here again, we've got that 25% uh, tolerance for the, the multi-point control here. So if we look at the frequency parameters, um, again, it's slightly different here in relation to uh, the different standards and looking at the frequency resolution. Um, so just be careful on your frequency resolution uh, when you're looking at doing a sign sweep, because um, your data points on your chart, when you're measuring fairly high sweep rates up at um, the, the two kilohertz mic, you might be missing data points um, out because you're sweeping so fast. So your, your frequency resolution at high frequency might not be able to meet that one hertz, so be careful there, depending on how your controller defines your uh, data points on your sign graphs. So looking at um, endurance test for 6068, there's some quite tight tolerances at low frequencies getting up to the um, less high tolerances at higher frequencies. And then there's a different set of tolerances 
but where you're measuring critical frequencies. So when you're measuring resonant frequencies, there's a different set of uh, frequency tolerances there. So these are the two. So mill standard just has a standard 0.1% uh, tolerance on the frequency measurements. Uh, and RTCA has a plus or minus two, so it doesn't it doesn't really talk too much um, about uh, tolerance. this is really on the frequency accuracy of instrumentation. So I'm not quite sure what where that stands in relation to the others. So the other sign test parameter is where we're looking at the the filtered and unfiltered channel. So with a sign test, we're always looking at a tracking filter value, so a filtered value giving us the amplitude at the drive frequency. So where the signal tolerance and distortion comes in is where we're looking at the difference between the unfiltered value, so how much noise and distortion you've got on the signal compared to the, the uh, value at the filtered value. So this signal tolerance kind of comes in at around 5% in the specifications, which equates to 32% distortion. So this is something you should really be looking at. Obviously, if you've got a worn shaker system or you've got lots of rattles and noises going on on your test rig, um, this will affect your, your testing. So just talking about tracking filters, because tracking filters are what gives you that true response at the drive frequency. Um, there's only advice in the test standards in relation to tracking filter uh, um, parameters. Um, really, the DEF stand comes up with advice that your tracking filter response should be at least five times your controller compression speed. Um, the filter bandwidth should be less than your drive frequency. Um, RTCA does come up with some uh, constant bandwidth and the percent constant percentage bandwidths in it. Um, it's the only specification I've seen those in. Um, I don't believe the MIL standard mentions anything about tracking filter values or the ACTP. So you can get the, the response time from your tracking filter from this equation down here. Um, and if we look at uh, a 10% constant bandwidth, we're looking at a 100 millisecond response time. And 10% uh, constant bandwidth gives you 10 periods at the drive frequency. So you can have 10 complete cycles um, at the drive frequency for a constant percentage bandwidth. So these are the parameters for sign testing. So if we just have a quick look, this is a, a test that was done at Vibration Research where we um, uh, put a frequency in at 1000 hertz and then looped back the, uh, the control back on itself. So we looked at um, the, the response to the 1000 uh, the hertz. So this is different tracking filter widths that we've set here, all the way from 1% all the way to 20%. So you can see here that you, if you are measuring a value um, at a different frequency than the, the drive frequency, how much uh, of an output you would see depending on your tracking filter width. So you can see the tracking filters not only have an uh, issue with your um, control response time, um, they do affect your measurements. If you've got a lot of out of band noise occurring because of noises and rattles and distortions. So, so they are important, these tracking filters. Okay, so I'll just have a quick look now at a basic sign test. So for our software, so we can look at our control tolerances. So if we look at our, our limits, so we can see our limits can either be dB or percentage here. We can obviously look at our control channels and we can go multi-point control and we can set channel limits here. Uh, look at our if we look at our parameters tab here so on our graph resolution you can see down here that we can actually type in a really high number if we want to and have 10,000 data points per graph on our graph here so this gives you that high frequency resolution high frequency if you need to or you can specify in in hertz if you want to um, we also have uh, on our analyzer uh, function, we can also display total harmonic distortion. So our signal tolerance, uh, we can actually provide you with a, a distortion plot um, during your testing. So you can put in your swept THD there as well. Um, back to on our parameters tab, uh, we use both a, a fractional bandwidth, so a constant bandwidth, um, as well as a uh, percentage bandwidth. So here are two values here that you can choose for that test. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the parameters within uh, the sign testing.
I think I'm probably getting close to time, but we're, we'll have a quick go to see if I can get through to the, the shock parameters. So we'll have a quick look at uh, classical shock tolerances, look at pulse shapes, the acceleration time history, look at velocity change and the frequency response filters, and then uh, compensation pulse effects on frequency content. So we'll have a quick look um, at the different standards and the different shape pulses that are within each standard. Um, I'm just going to be looking at half sine terminal peak in the trapezoidal. Um, the DEF stand has a damp sinusoidal in there. They also both um, MIL standard and DEF standard have SRS test and time waveform replication tests within them. Um, and the same for the ACTP. The RTCA only has a terminal peak sawtooth pulse in there. Okay. So just having a quick look at uh, the parameters for classical shock. You have a, a pulse duration, so it's quite often a tolerance on the pulse percentage uh, duration. There's a peak amplitude, and there are um, the minimum time that you should be looking at your shock pulse for, whether it be within a mechanical shock machine or, in our case, a, a vibration exciter. Um, there's also a tolerance on the velocity um, of a pulse. So these are the general tolerances that you see within MIL standard 810H, DEF stand 0035, and ACTP 408. So looking at these, so uh, the, the key points here are we should be looking at an integration time for our velocity change. So I see the uh, velocity change is really seeing how close you're meeting this blue line and that you're not under testing down here. So it's a bit of an equivalent of a, a GRMS for your vibration test. Really. So you should be looking at that. Uh, and within the standards now, there isn't really there is no difference between a shock machine shock and a, um, a shaker shock. They all require you to have a look at the velocity change. Hopefully, with a, a shaker shock, you should be looking at um, always meeting the blue line, unless you're overdriving your shaker and not able to sustain the acceleration levels. So, for a shaker shock, we should be looking at monitoring the, the time history for a total of six uh, pulse durations. So there's a, the trapezoidal pulse again. This is the mil standard 810, the DEF stand W35, and the ACTP 34. Um, They've all got the same torrent slide within them. Uh, this is just a quick look back to the earlier mil standard 810G and RTCA D160 torrences. Um, they had just the terminal peak sawtooth pulse in, and they had a, a velocity change requirement of plus minus 10% on the, the nominal pulse. Uh, and you can see here whether you're supposed to be monitoring for six durations or three durations, depending on a, a shock machine or a shaker shock. And again, it's still got the integration time before and after the pulse there for calculating your velocity change. There's the MILSAND 810G. So previously, MILSAND 810G had very tight tolerances. I think they were trying to avoid people from using shaker shocks. So they had very tight pre-pulse uh, tolerances here to try and stop you from preloading the, the test item with a pre-pulse. Um, and they have had some requirements in here and still have in relation to the, the frequency content of your pulse. So just to kind of have a look at this, um, there are requirements for that pre and post tolerances. Um, and within the MIL standard, it says, that so if we look at a shock response spectrum, so we're looking at frequency content from a shock. Um, you can see here this is the demand line. So this would be the reference line if we weren't um, applying any pre and post tails to the to, to the shock. Um, and then what I've done here is just plotted it with 20% pre-post lines and seeing where it affects the frequency. So uh, uh, the caveat here with the test standards are that. This effect, this roll off because of the pre pulse, should be um, at least to be no more than half your natural frequency of your, your test item. So, if you've got a, a resonance of around 20 hertz on your product, then you might just about get away with those pre and post uh, tolerances at 20%. But anything with a, a resonance below 20 hertz, you're going to start getting into problems with. Um, with those levels of pre and post um, pulse size. So with our software, if, with the SRS um, edition, you can actually have a look at these pulses. And when you're changing your pre and post compensation pulses on your shock, you can see what effect you're having on your um, shock response spectrum from that shock. So it's a really good uh, thing to look at. 
Here are the frequency response functions. So ever so quickly, um, they ask you to look at the frequency response of your system and how many samples per second you're, you're making. So depending on the pulse width, it tells you what the highest cut frequency should be depending on your pulse width. So that's within W35. There's a different values for RTCA, D160G, um, and the ACGP has different values again. So here are for the shock response spectrum uh, torrents lines. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I pretty much come to the end of uh, the main part of the presentation, and I'm just about three o'clock. So if you uh, if you have any questions, then uh, feel free to freeze. I'll uh, stay online for a little while longer. And um, thank you very much for your time. So if, if we uh, don't get any questions coming in for now, then I'll um, what I'll do is I'll let you guys know a little bit more about uh, um, vibration research for those that uh, want to stay on the line and see where we're at. So there's my contact details at the end of the presentation there. Um, you can email directly at mark.brown at vibrationresearch.co.uk um, or you can telephone me on my mobile or office number. Um, you can. Okay, so vibration research. So this is John Van Barron and Phil Van Barron. Um, the company was started back in 1997 um, with John and his wife Valerie. Um, John was uh, working for um, another uh, shaker manufacturing and decided to set up his own company. So Phil joined him about a year later. So our core values, um, this is something that we uh, try and live by within vibration re research. We love collaborating with people. So if you have any issues um, out there, then we'd love to collaborate with you and look at uh, ways of improving our software. Um, we feel that uh, we're all capable and competent here. So there's a great training sessions here from Vibration Research. Um, we like to ensure that we're accountable and responsible for everything we do. Uh, we've got a very strong and driven work, work ethic and we always like to do the right thing. And above all, beyond that, we love to innovate. So please come to us with uh, any of your, your needs or changes you'd like to make with the software. So Vibration Research, uh, here are offices in red around the world. We have offices, obviously, our headquarters are in the United States. We have offices in uh, Germany and Eastern Europe, here in the UK, in Russia and in China and India. So our key developments, we've been pushing the bounds of vibration testing for, for many years. So we were the first people to come out with uh, field data replication, which enables the test engineers to reproduce data from their lab. Um, from actual acceleration waveforms measured in the field. Back in 2005, we came out with ketogen control. So not just looking at ketosis values um, and seeing the probability density function there, we can actually change from a Gaussian distribution to different ketosis values. So we can put real world peaks into the vibration test. In 2010, we came up with uh, the uh, field damage spectrum. So we're using um, standard algorithms there for uh, looking at getting field data from different percentages of lives in different environments all into one single uh, vibration spec. So I think we have a, a talk on that coming up in the next week or so. And then in 2015, uh, we came out with IDOF. Um, this is a, a, an issue that was arrived due to the tight tolerances within some space specifications and the fact that we, if we're stepping up from a lower level test to a high level um, test um, during the equalization phase, um, a lot of the other controller manufacturers were using that lower level data for their full level test. So you weren't really seeing what was going on on your test for the first 30 seconds or a minute of your testing. So it's really kind of problematic um, that you don't get the right degrees of freedom at the start of those tests. It's very important on space where you've got fairly short duration tests that you know that you're in control, you've got a very um, expensive test item. So what IDOF does, it allows you to see through that peakiness and get to very high degrees of freedom very quickly within four frames of data. So if you'd like to have a look at that, um, that's something we'd love to demo to you people. Here's some of our valued customers from uh, around the world. So we're, uh, we're a fairly large company that deals with all the major companies around the world that do vibration testing. 
So VR vibration research products. We have our main VR 9500, and um, we should have uh, a new vibration controller coming out uh, this year that will add more channels and more capabilities for, for people. We've got a, a data acquisition system, our portable data analyzer, um, OBSA, OBSA 1000 with its OBSA view software. And then we also have a small range of shaker systems that we sell as well. So here's the uh, VR9500. So there's a quick overview of its hardware capabilities. And here's the uh, list of SAR software packages. So um, here's the uh, Observer, 1, Observer 1000, our portable data analyzer. So it's a standalone device, uh, Wi Fi connected. Um, it's got 16 input channels, all with TEDs. It's got a dual TACO input, uh, SD card storage on it, uh, gigabit Ethernet connection. It can also act as a vibration controller now. So it's uh, got a uh, uh, ability to um, run as a vibration controller. It's got six hours vibration life, um, maximum sampling of 828 kilohertz. Okay, quick overview of the Observer 1000 software. So you can use our vibration uh, recorder view software. You can edit and view. You can do live transient capture. Um, you can do live and offline FFTs and PSDs. There's optional software to increase the analyzer mode, shock response spectrum and fatigue damage, um, which gives you an, a, uh, an offline fatigue damage spectrum. So got great capabilities. So here's a quick view of ObserView software. So it's got great editing features. It's got really short startup times. You can open recordings, open and edit recording sessions, view and configure channels with it, um, navigate really large recordings very quickly and easily, drag and drop cursors. It's a really good modern tool for manipulating time history data and looking at frequency content. Okay, so if we've got no more questions, thank you all for coming. Um, there's been uh, quite a good response for this, so we'll be looking to run more of these sessions in future. But um, I hope you have a, enjoy the rest of your day and um, keep safe, everybody.